Um, we'll get started first, and I think that uh, Senator Wichert here is uh, first to get going. So, Senator, I'll hand it off to you. Okay, let's make sure this is on. Well, hi, everybody. My name's Anna Wishart, and I'm a state senator. We're actually sitting in my district. I represent District 27, which is West Lincoln. And some of you may remember me. I worked for Senator Ken Har, who, as you know, was um, very active uh, in supporting renewable energy legislation. And this is actually one of the, this is the main reason I ran for office. And it's one of the main issues that I talk to going door to door. Uh, talk to both Republicans and Democrats and independents and unanimously people supported Nebraska taking advantage of the renewable resources that we have in the state. My vision, and this is something I would love to see happen in my eight years of service, is that we take advantage of the resources we have. We not only be a state that generates 100% of our energy from our own resources, but we also look at being one of the main dominant states for being an energy producer for the rest of the country and the world. But I echo uh, what Senator Wishart mentioned. My name is Senator Tony Vargas. I represent downtown in South Omaha, which is District 7. So if you came out of town, you flew in to my district. Um, I got elected here about two years ago. I serve on the Appropriations Committee with her and that guy over there. Um, he's our mighty chairman. Um, but uh, I, I do echo the sentiments that I, I want to make sure that we are being as, um, uh, as I don't want to use necessarily the word progressive about um, the way that we sort of diversify energy in our state and uh, quite honestly think very creatively about the, it's not always the big things, sometimes it's the small things. And so at some point I'll talk about a bill I introduced two years ago. Um, small things that can increase some of the efficiencies, um, take advantage of some of the programs that we have at the state level, make it easier for people to take advantage of some of our, um, our, our programs, or, or some of the ways that we can move the ball forward uh, in terms of energy efficiency and just diversifying energy in our state. So I'm looking forward to this conversation. Thank you for having me. And I'm Dan Quick, a state senator from Grand Island, District 35. And uh, I know last year I sat on this panel, and some of you probably heard me say, don't throw any coal at me, because I used to work at a coal fire plant for the city of Grand Island for about, for about 28 years. Uh, but I think more importantly, I, work, I, figure, I look at it that I work for public power for 28 years, and I understand the importance of public power and how it plays a role in, in, uh, in Nebraska. And I know what Grand Island has done to diversify uh, their generation. They have uh, coal, they have natural gas, they have wind, and they have solar. So, and I think public power has done a good job to try to, to move in that direction, to try to, to, to help Nebraska and try to help bring in renewables to our, to our state. So, and I also serve a natural resource committee, so. Ken was right, this is about economic development and I've always looked at wind and solar uh, in the form of economic development. Um, and I should also tell you that I'm from District 48, all of Scotts Bluff County. And I will add that that is where the sun shines in Nebraska. I come down here, I, I, you wonder why we get so angry during the end of sessions, it's because we've never seen the sun during the whole time. So I drive home every once in a while just to see the sun, but one of the things that, even when I was, before I was running for uh, the legislature, I'd drive 45 miles to Kimball, there would be, there was a, a wind project there, I think it was eight towers. 15 miles south of there, 60 miles from Scotts Bluff, you go across the Colorado border and as far as you can see from the east to the west is a wind power project. There's windmills as far as you can see on both sides. Colorado committed to this early. And I, I believe that they actually have statutes that say, you know, at some point in time, 2030 or some date, that we will have renewable energy uh, about 40 percent, I believe, is what the legislation said, but they may have changed that since that time. Um, so I'm very much interested in seeing how, how these discussions evolve. I think there's still some concern that we still need to have subsidies to make this uh, work as far as wind power. Solar is one of those situations. We do have a, po a pilot project out west, and I'm interested in seeing what that looks like. Um, so I'm trying to stay as close as I can. But the other thing that I want to make sure that everybody understands, you people have to educate us. You know, I'm on appropriations and I'm 
still trying to figure out why I was invited to be here, but in any <laughs> event, um, the education process, uh, we deal with an assortment of subjects that you can't believe. I mean, HHS on through the budget, that's what most of our time is. It's a complete immersion. And, and uh, what I'm looking for out of this group is the education, the promotion, and possibly the legislation that's needed. And uh, I do acknowledge the fact that we're well behind uh, other states. Um, I actually, my last, one of my last ventures as a banker was a net metering project in Custer County, which uh, we financed. So I'm interested in this area. Uh, I need some education. I need some input. Uh, and I'm looking forward to uh, listening to the questions in the discussion. Thank you. Now, thanks, John. John's on the western part of the state, and I'm in Omaha, which is District 20, Central Omaha. Uh, I currently serve on the Natural Resource Board. Uh, it's been an exciting four years, four sessions uh, on that particular committee. I also served on the MUD Board of Directors for 30 years, so I've had some experience with utility work. Uh, probably my, my claim to fame with this group is my introduction of LB 824, which in effect leveled the playing field uh, for renewable energy in Nebraska. And uh, it's had, I think, a, a pretty dramatic effect on the economic status of the state, having brought in about $2.6 billion, and that's a, that's a big investment. It's an exciting time for us to be in this business. It truly is. A solar is a sleeping giant. And as John seemed to indicate, that's going to develop out in the western part of the state where we have terrific resources for solar. So I, I think the effect of renewable energy in Nebraska is going to do nothing more but increase dramatically. Thanks for coming and your support. One question that, that's always around there and as we look at this stuff and, and in a public power state like Nebraska where, um, where we had certain obstacles um, with renewable generation and how to, uh, how to encourage that here in the state. Uh, obviously, Senator McAllister talked about uh, LB-824, and before that it was LB-1048 that was put in place. And, and as you've gone down since those years that that's been passed, do you guys see any other places where legislation needs to be put into place to address some of the issues um, that we're seeing today in this changing market? I think what you're speaking of, Ken, are the local regulations, particularly the, the regulations from counties. And that's a double-edged sword, truly is. Those counties have the ultimate authority when it comes to citing some of these renewable energy projects. And that's probably as it should be. You may be aware of some of the issues that have been occurring in that Cherry County area. Well, they've chosen to deal with uh, renewable energy in the way that they have. Or contrast that with Lancaster County. You know, you have to rely on the, those counties to determine what local re regulations you should have. Uh, like I say, it's a double-edged sword. So let's let's allow them to continue to govern govern the siting as they have uh, the last two or three, four years. Senator Wizard. I'd like to see the state uh, actually sit down and develop a comprehensive energy plan and. We have public power, they do generation, they do transmission. There are bonds outstanding and, and uh, some debt to be serviced and they've done a very good job being low cost producer and every time I meet with them I remind them that they have to be low cost producer. Uh, so they've heard that story from me. But uh, developing an overall energy strategy I think would, be, would go a long way toward promoting renewables and where they fit within within what we're doing within the grid. Now, I'm in western Nebraska, so we're in the western power, power grid. The rest of it's southwest, but uh, certainly I heard that there may be some combinations of western and, and southwestern uh, combining in some fashion. I know Banner County, which is just south of uh, Scotts Bluff, is the number one county uh, in the state of Nebraska, number three in the United States for wind generation potential, but it sits there remotely by itself. It's 50 miles west of uh, or east of Chugwater, Wyoming, which will be a huge uh, uh, wind generation uh, development. And is the state of Nebraska in a position where maybe they could help in terms of getting that infrastructure, at least to the state line? 
don't know the answer to that, but that would all be part of a strategy. So I agree with Senator Sinner. I, I think there's better ways that we can leverage sort of a longer, like a, lar a longer term planning in this arena. Uh, and we do have our legislative planning committee. Uh, I, I think we should try to figure out ways to leverage when we're in that committee, which is focused on sort of our larger strategies for the state of Nebraska, legislative priorities, we tend to focus on demographic data, you know, unemployment, um, our, our changing um, urban versus rural uh, uh, populations in the state. But we don't talk about, sometimes we talk about, let's say, energy or renewables as an other, as a separate. It's not part of the larger conversation on economic development. And I think that's something that we we should do, and if you think it's a good idea, please come up and talk to us. There's many of us, there's a few of us here that are on that committee. Um, and the problem we have is we, we do have term limits. It's not bad or good, but we have term limits, so we're, we're leaving, and then people are picking up where we left off and have to sort of really glean from your expertise. If we can have a, a, a stronger, longer-term strategy that's inclusive of um, some of the larger things we need to do to grow our state, and part of this is... Um, thinking about renewables and energy, and then I think we're going to be better off. Yeah, so a few things. Thinking about other legislation we could work on, we could definitely look at a renewable portfolio standard. I would say we should, we should set it at 100%. I don't think we should sell ourselves short, so that's something we could look at. I think we should also look at what our goals are for export. What we want to see as a state in terms of the money we can bring in from the resources we have, because we have enough land and wind and solar and biofuels to be able to export as well and become the, the next energy generating state. So I think that's something we should do. I think we need a total revamp of our net metering um, laws. I think we need to increase the, the, the limit um, and expand that. I've been talking with some egg producers who are interested uh, in the idea of anaerobic digesters, um, which helps us in so many ways in terms of clean air, clean water, and being able to use um, manure for fuel as well. I mean, that's, that's a pretty incredible trifecta right there. Um, so that's something we can work on as a state because we have plenty of industrial egg in the state. Uh, I wanted to actually also touch on what Senator McAllister said about local control. I think at this point I agree with him that we're a local control st state, and I, I do think in terms of zoning, a lot of the times the best decisions are made as local as possible. But with that said, I do think we need to push back a little um, when you hear from counties and constituents who are crying out about property taxes, who are the same constituents that are shutting down wind developments. I was at a Lancaster County Board retreat, and their first slide was about the, the, the necessity to reduce property taxes. And literally, their next slide was the fact that they shut down that wind development that would have brought in $700,000 uh, annually, which is a lot of money for Lancaster County. They could do a lot of money with that. Um, and you know, I pushed back on them for that. I said, you know, you, you can't on one hand be arguing for property tax relief and then on the, on the, on the other hand be uh, obst obstructing any form of economic development that would help and aid in reducing property taxes. So I do think it's on all of us to push back a little bit on that. Yeah, and uh, sitting on the Natural Resource Committee, we, we uh, heard from uh, all the people in the Sand Hills about that issue with uh, local control and some of that. And, and uh, that is, I still believe that it should be controlled locally through the planning, zone, planning or zoning committees or your county supervisors. Uh, the one thing that I think probably needs to happen more often is that uh, make sure you have, there's enough education, enough information put out there so people really understand what's happening and what the issues are. So, um, you know, and I know this probably doesn't have to do with legislation, but I would like to see us bring in more uh, manufacturing of uh, wind energy products or equipment into the state. I know at one time there was talk in Grand Island that they may bring in a, uh, a facility that would uh, manufacture turbine blades. And then we actually ended up, I think we lost out to Newton, Kansas on that bid. But uh, that would have been really a huge economic uh, driver for Grand Island and for the state of Nebraska. Great. Thank you, Senators. Um, another question that, that we've got, and this is something that has kind of been an issue ever since uh, 
ever since we started talking about renewable generation and and how it uh, how it fits into the system, but it, it's about the uh, net metering issue and and the question is what are the plans, if any, to increase the cap of 25 kW for net metering in Nebraska? Are there any plans that you guys know of that are out there uh, to be uh, brought up this session? Are there any other ideas out there on on how to do that? Um, considering the constraints that uh, that we've we've heard about from uh, from the power entities so I am just starting to work on legislation to increase um, the the current cap that we have and starting to work with some of the large egg producers on this um, you know my goal was five megawatts and then everybody's eyes popped out of their heads uh, I always want us to be the most competitive state in, for, for anything. I want us to be the most competitive, um, and that would make us the most. Um, but being more realistic, um, you know, tw 25 kilowatts is, is just, it's not enough for any business, especially, that wants to invest uh, in capturing this energy in a renewable way. And so I am, I know Senator Carol Blood is looking at another piece of legislation as well. So there will at least be two um, coming through the legislature next session. I, I know uh, sitting on natural resources, we've had uh, um, a net metering bill that came before us in the, in the past. I know one thing I think people need to, to do as well of, uh, like you say, you're working with the ag, but you should probably work with some of the, the uh, smaller power districts as well, because I know some of their substations can't handle the power that would feed back into those lines. So uh, you, you have to figure out a way, how are you gonna make that work? How are the lines gonna handle that? So, um, you know, I, I can understand the need for it, uh, but we also have to be, make sure that we're working with everybody and have everybody at the table uh, if, if, if it's gonna be successful. And uh, I know another issue that come up was, uh, was the, uh, the or, uh, I forget the word for it, but uh, they wanted to, to put meters or put a, a facility on one place and then actually have it uh, be able to supply power to another farm a location and another, actually another power district. So that can actually cause some problems for the power districts as well for, you know, making sure that that farmer receives his, uh, the money back for his, uh, the power he produces. And uh, so I know that's another issue that might come up, but uh, uh, I haven't heard anything this year about that yet. If any legislation does include uh, incentive programs or reductions in revenue or something along those lines, pretty much dead on arrival. We've got a budget that is going to be, uh, again, pretty tight. Um, it looks like Medicaid expansion is going to compete with whatever gains that we get in uh, internet sales tax. A lot of people are predicting 2020 as a downturn. How that gets into the forecasting numbers in October 26th, I guess I don't know, but I'm not predicting a very robust uh, situation. So, um, you know, we did cut, for an example, 60 some million dollars out of provider rates. There has to be some restoration of those dollars. We cut a lot of our agencies need to be, uh, State Patrol, for an example, is living on about 35 to 40 vacancies. That funding needs to be restored to some of the agencies that we cut, so that will be a priority. Compare and contrast that with trying to get, which is my top priority, uh, the rainy day fund back up to at least about a $500 million number, and that's the number that the governor believes is adequate. I think it's a little bit higher than that, but certainly that's a goal. Uh, we've got a good start on it, folks. Uh, I think you saw the numbers out of September, north of 60 million. You know, we're running pretty pretty good right now. Don't get carried away. Uh, a lot of that will go into the rainy day fund, some of it property tax relief. So lots of competing interests, and that's, that's a problem. So um, as far as legislation that would have some of that, Nebraska Advantage Act has to be rewritten or re retweaked. That's another priority that's in front of us. So um, net metering and a lot of this stuff, many times from a priority standpoint, stands behind that. And you may not like hearing that, but that's kind of the reality of the situation. So, and I'm always somebody that brings bad news. I'm, I'm used to it. <laughs> Thanks, John. Net metering is a real challenge for the utilities. Uh, you know, for some reason, we all want power in the summer 
when it's 100 degrees outside, we want power no matter what. So having that power available is pretty darn important. So that managing those peak loads, you know, brings for big challenges for the utilities. Also, it also has a big impact on their income statement too. So, you know, I think net metering is something we're going to continue to see an increase of, about, but we need to be careful how we do it because it's it does have a big in impact on the utilities finances. Thank you guys for that one. Appreciate it. And as, as you talked, Senator Stinner and others about uh, about uh, incentives and things like that. I know that uh, a few years back in the legislature. Uh, it, there was incentives passed in the Nebraska advantage for wind development and things like that. And, and the question out there is, what do you see going forward as far as support for those kinds of incentives um, as you tweak this Nebraska advantage that you talk about? Too early to tell, to tell you the truth. In fact, we just had the chamber in, and, and we're, we're looking at it from, um, from an economic development stance. Senator McAllister and I sit on a, a task force right now on the chamber um, actually said we just need a whole we we need a whole new thought process a whole new bill so we're we're still in that process of trying to bring somebody in to facilitate that get enough people in the room to participate so that we don't so that we have the appropriate amount of information uh, how it what it's going to look like what the priorities are I think wind will have and solar will have a a, a part and a piece of that but. Uh, it's, it's hard to know. It's a work in process. So if you're sitting there and you are an advocate, you need to weigh in. And this is all part of that legislative process I'm talking, uh, talking to you about, about educating us, about promoting it. Now's the time to really start to, to think about how you communicate your thoughts with us. Yes, Nebraska's position, relative position with compared to other states, we're in a good spot right now. You know, both Kansas, Oklahoma, and Texas, you know, they did have some state incentives that were, you know, pretty expensive on the state budget. Now, we really don't have much in, in terms of incentives relatively uh, compared with the other states. But we'll need to watch that carefully as we develop a, a plan and work with uh, the incentive programs that we have in the state. Um, speaking of economic development, uh, somebody sent in a question that says, and of course we've got uh, Blueprint Nebraska out there that's coming together and starting to come up with some, uh, some scenarios and stuff on, on how best to move forward with economic development. And the question is, is the Blueprint Nebraska Commission investigating Nebraska's economic development opportunities from renewable energy? Um, and I think you could look both at that as the development of renewable energy itself as well as the ancillary businesses that are coming in, say like the Facebook data center, things like that, where it's, where it's a reason why that economic development is coming in. Anyone? Yeah, it, it looks like all of uh, the Amazons and, and that whole list of folks are looking at green energy and you have to have it to be competitive to attract them, there's no question about that. I, I you know, it, Blueprint Nebraska is going to look at the strengths and weaknesses and the opportunities, go through that whole SWAT process. What's one of our major strengths? It's wind, it's solar, it's water. Those types of things have got to be calculated into any plan that they're going to put out. But again, I, I would hope that people here are involved in that blueprint. I know right now there is a period where you can weigh in to the blueprint people as to what you think should be in there. So this is an opportunity for you and your organization and association to weigh into the blueprint, so. To add on to what Senator Sinner was saying and to put a plug in for Blueprint Nebraska, if you go to their website, uh, there's on their front page is a survey you can take. I would encourage all of you to take it and to, to really plug in renewable energy because they will be uh, looking at this survey, compiling the data, and then moving forward based off of the input that they get from Nebraskans. Another question that we have here is, uh, is there any legislation being contemplated or should there be legislation put forward that would encourage battery storage and the placement of battery storage here in Nebraska? Does anybody have any thoughts on that? If you have legislative ideas, bring them to us. Right, very good, yeah. 
Yeah, I don't know that there's any legislation, but I can tell you that battery storage will probably change the way uh, solar is viewed and, and how reliable that will make it. So, uh, you know, belonging to the Southwest Power Pool, that, uh, you know, having a, a reliable source from solar along with, uh, I would say you'd probably be able to store uh, wind energy as well. Um, that will probably affect some of the, you know, the way we produce energy in the state. So it'll, it'll be a big thing, so. Batteries will be a game changer for renewable energy. Absolutely, no question about that. You know, if you can balance out a load, you know, store the batteries or store energy in a battery uh, when, the, when the wind's blowing or the sun's shining, uh, you've got a heck of a deal. And that's it's going to be a, a major change, a game changer for sure. I think it's Wyoming that has proposed pumping all of this extra uh, energy that they're going to produce out of this wind farm into the salt mines in, in Utah and store it that way. Old technology, but kind of interesting. And one of the things that we deal with all the time is how best do we provide uh, uh, public relations to folks to, to explain to them and, and, and give them that, uh, that reason to look at, at issues such as wind energy and renewable. How, how best does a group like this uh, tell their story? How do they get out to the people and how best, how if most efficiently do they, uh, they get their message to the people that need to hear it? Well, I was at an Invenergy tour a few months ago, and one thing that was great is there were a bunch of county commissioners and um, people who served on the plan planning commission sitting around a table talking about sort of the pluses and minuses of wind energy. And I think it was really helpful to have people who are from the same community or a community just, you know, you know, uh, 30 minutes away, talk about sort of um, how wind has benefited and, and how it hasn't. And it was especially helpful when one county commissioner who was adamantly opposed has, they've been developed and has had a complete transformation because when the wind company came in, they brought in about a million dollars in revenue annually and also fixed a ton of their roads. Uh, and so it was just this sort of eye-opening experience um, for him. And so it was great to see that kind of really local, local conversation. So as, as many of those that can happen as possible. Raise, raise your hand if you know your local state legislator. So there's some hands that are not raised. I, I think one of the easiest ways to, to then be um, focus on publicity is really to tell the stories from yourself. I often talk to my colleagues in the, about specific bill ideas or things and they'll say, oh, I had 15, 20 people contact me about this bill. I think I'm going to vote yes for it. I, I had 15, 20 people tell me that this is a bad idea. I think I'm going to vote no for it. The margins are razor, razor thing. And I think we always expect sort of this bystander effect that somebody else is going to do it. Or the, the alliance that we're a part of or the association we're a part of is going to make sure our message is sent. And then we don't talk with the people that are most local to us or that are legislators. And, and not just once, but to build a relationship with them so they really understand what the world looks like from your perspective. It seems like a very small thing, but I, I, that's why I asked to raise their hand. And, I'd bet you if I kept asking, how often do you talk to that legislator? What's your relationship like with your county commissioners? If we can't engender a relationship with them and educate them, then it won't matter if we have a larger publicity because they're the ones that are making the larger decisions in regards to really what's going to impact your work. Now let's move on. We talked a little bit about battery storage and, and stuff. And, and this is a question about uh, electric vehicles. And it asks, and I'm not, I'm not sure exactly um, what laws it's speaking of, but it says, would you be open to amending the public power laws to allow third parties, i.e. like a Chubby's Quick Stop, to sell electricity just for electric vehicles? That's something, and, and if we think about it, that's probably something that we're gonna, that we're gonna be hit with in, in the face more and more as we move forward. And so um, whether, whether we get an answer here tonight or we we uh, plant the seed in folks' head to start thinking about that. It's probably I'm sure I'm sure there's some folks out here that have some ideas on that too. Come and talk to us because I, I don't know. Yeah, you know one of the things one of the things that uh, that we talk about and that we look at um, 
is, is, there, any, is there any sense or any notion to uh, take another look at the nameplate tax, nameplate capacity tax um, as it sits out mm -hmm. there? Um, right now, I remember when we, uh, when we did that, obviously we were looking at uh, mostly wind generation at that time. Uh, with the advent of uh, and the increase in the solar industry that's happening there, um, does it make sense to relook at that nameplate capacity for solar as it's kind of a little different animal than it is for, uh, for wind generation? So open that one up to the crowd too. Senator McAllister, do you? I think it probably does, but I haven't studied the issue as, as, as much as I should. Uh, the capacity tax occurred uh, before I came to the legislature, so uh, I think we do need to study that issue and, and uh, look what the effect might be. One question here is, uh, educating our kids is important. Uh, can't we earmark taxes, nameplate, and personal for schools and encourage them to spend more on students and their education? So I don't... I'm, I'm not sure completely about the funding source or the nameplate tax. That's, that's not an issue I know about. But I will say, putting another hat on, I work for Nebraska's After School Network. So we work with a coalition of communities across the state that support school-based after school and summer school programming. And it doesn't always take funding. Sometimes it just takes having an expert in wind energy or solar energy to come in and meet with these kids. The great the great thing about after school and summer school is that the, um, the boundaries are your imagination. Sometimes it's harder to get into the school day because there are so many federal regulations. So I would say that if you're thinking about or you're interested in um, getting kids excited about renewable energy and having kids participate in local renewable energy projects, um, please reach out to me. Uh, in, in my capacity uh, as the after school network um, because we have a ton of coalition communities across the state, Scotts Bluff, Shadron, Crete, North Platte, you name it, um, with vibrant after school and summer school programs that are just waiting to partner with people who are in this business and industry. Yeah, similarly, I, I think this is a, a local uh, opportunity that as a former school board member and as a former middle school science teacher once upon a time, I think the best way is to then engage in your community and, and talk with school board members. Uh, they're going to be the ones that can potentially advocate for some of these opportunities that are existing at the, at the local level. I know uh, um, the school district in Grand Island have the career pathways uh, there, and they uh, recently just added aviation as one of their uh, um, the school um, education pieces. So I know that's a way that maybe we could bring that uh, into our schools. It's a public-private partnership. We have a, uh, a, a there they have uh, uh, they have more CNC mills and lays than I've seen in a lot of a lot of business uh, businesses around our community. And uh, what they've done is partnered with them. The businesses have brought the invested into the school. Uh, the school actually uh, trains the kids. They uh, work with the partner with the community college. Um, those kids earn credits while they're uh, high school kids earn credits while they're taking those classes, and then uh, actually when they're right out of high school, uh, they work with an employer. An employer hires them right out of high school at a, really a higher wage than they would have made uh, just coming off the street. Uh, the, the employer then sends them on to get their associate's degree through the community college and then hires them back to work for them. Uh, it's almost like an apprenticeship program. So uh, I think that's maybe an opportunity where, uh, um, you know, whether it's wind or solar uh, uh, projects that they could actually incorporate into the school curriculum. Um, I know they're already working with uh, uh, trying to bring electricians, train electricians, plumbers, uh, a lot of the skilled labor trades. So I think that's a, that's a way we could look at uh, providing that. I'd like to just look at the curriculum and really task this group to put together a curriculum that we can that we could look at. I don't know if we need to throw any extra money or we just need to fold it into what we have. I know there's discussions about carbon footprints and what we can do to be more efficient and effective. So I think most of you know that there are more people installing solar panels than there are coal miners. It goes to show you where the employment is going uh, 
uh, with uh, energy. Uh, Josh Moaning, who's over there, uh, has a school in Norfolk which teaches folks how to how to be uh, involved with the the uh, solar and the and the and the wind energy, and that's something we need to continue. We need to talk about one other subject that is pretty darn important. Some of you may have seen the UN report regarding climate change. This business is going to have a big factor in terms of reducing the carbon footprint. And so I salute you for all that you're doing to improve this business because it, it's we need to reduce carbon and uh, this is, you, you can make that, that happen. So uh, I think we're probably going to work on a climate change bill of some kind. Uh, I, I'd be grateful for any suggestions that you'd have on how to produce a bill that would be effective. Okay, I think we've got time for, let's do one more question. And uh, the last question for the day is, as senators, as you're looking out there um, at, at all the issues that affect uh, your decision making on renewable energy and things like that, what data from industry engineers, developers, financiers, et cetera, would be helpful for you as legislators to develop state policy and work within our public power system and with public power? I think what would be very helpful is to sit down with public power and some of the other entities involved in, in this industry and map out what it would take and how long it would take for us to be able to achieve 100% renewable energy. I think it would be the Omaha Chamber of Commerce had this event. <clears throat> they brought in a futurist. It's a thing. Yeah, yeah, okay which I just think is a really long-term strategic thinker, right? And so they, they, they talked about what, what, is Omaha, what is Omaha gonna look like if we're gonna have, what do we need to do if we need to have a thousand technology jobs in Omaha? And how do we backwards plan? What are the, what are the partners, the, the, the organizations, the corporate fundraising, the, all the partners that we need at the table to make that happen in the next five to 10 years, 20, 20 years? I think we need to do the same thing for energy, not renewable energy, and figure out a way to then bring in partners that um, may not always have uh, a stake in this. Um, I think we need to bring in schools, we need to bring in obviously businesses, we need to bring in chambers of commerce that are really dedicating to focus on economic development, and this isn't always part of that conversation. And I think if those data points that we're always talking about, about the jobs created, about new market opportunities, then we're more likely to then find some collaboration. Um, so if we had some data points around that, I think that would be a good step in the right direction. Yeah, and I, uh, I agree. I mean, you have to have everybody at the table. I mean, you have to have input from all sides because, you know, whatever you do affects, well, it affects public power, affects the citizens, affects the rate payers. So, and then, uh, but make sure that we have everybody at the table so we can all come up with a solution uh, uh, to bring renewables into the state, so. Yeah, we do have some, some pretty big stakeholders uh, in the future of, for wind energy, solar energy, and renewables. Who are some of those stakeholders? Well, definitely it's the university because they could be on the cutting edge of battery development. And I think they should definitely be uh, a stakeholder, public power. You know, we have to help them through this morass of, of uh, changing environment that we've, we, we have in this state. Government, I think government is gonna be a stakeholder in, in the future. And finally, and perhaps most important, consumer groups. Because we need to make sure whatever we do doesn't all of a sudden pile big rate increases on, on consumers that are already burdened by, by so many other costs. So, you know, working with those various groups, I think we can, we can move this forward this business forward and, and uh, improve uh, all of our situation in Nebraska. I want to give them a big round of applause and thank them for being here today.